of uh, statistical models for networks. Right now we'll be on to um, the joint selection models. We've heard now about modeling networks, about modeling outcomes, and designing experiments, and the models for designing experiments, and experimental models of designs. <laughs> um, uh, and now what we're interested in is sort of this the joint problem of figuring out how you model both an outcome and the network simultaneously. And um, this is known variously in the literature as the end of day problem or the selection and influence problem. And the problem uh, that was described yesterday by Sharp nicely is this, the, this whole series of econometrics that shows these are difficult things to do, these mirror influence models, because the, you, know, you don't know if A is causing B or B is causing A. And so um, about you know, sometime in this sort of push in the early 90s, there was a, a development of stochastic actor-oriented models by Tom Schneiders. Um, and these models were pains in the ass to use. <laughs> truly, truly pains in the ass. It was a standalone package that you like had to stand on your head and get to work, and not a package is the wrong word. I steep standalone program that you got, and Tom would write you personalized notes of how to get it to work. And um, it was it was it was great, but terrible. Um, and then the team worked together like many of the rest of these teams and um, pulled it into R. And uh, David has been um, integral to this process, of working with it on the applied side and making sure that, um, uh, that us as a community it and make sure that it works right, um, as well as doing some of the best work on the new um, uh, extensions of it and making it possible to see things that are really interesting in terms of the kind of experiments that Carter was talking about earlier today. So um, David's professor of sociology at the University of California, Irvine, um, and uh, thank you for coming. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, thank you, Jim, for having me and for everyone for sticking around for a long day of network statistics. Um, this is um, one of my favorite parts of the year, so I'm glad um, we're, all, we're all here. Um, so I'm gonna talk about stochastic actor-oriented models. They're also, you'll see them called stochastic actor-based models, or I'll call them Sienna models because that's what we were doing in the late 90s was running Sienna models. Um, so I'm gonna talk about, um, I'm not gonna talk about how to run a model um, or how to set up your data. That's a whole multi-hour long workshop. There are some old slides and, and, and videos up on the website here that you can look at for that. Instead, I'm going I'm to go into a little more detail on some things that we usually don't have the time to really get into in, in those kind of workshops, and some really, so, so some, really some, some conceptual things that are worthwhile to be, to be thinking about um, that may not be obvious um, when you're first learning one of these models. Okay, so I hope to get to all four of these. We'll see how that goes, but I want to talk a little bit about different forms that network influence can take. Um, and then talk about how we can think about peer influence on categorical outcomes, uh, which isn't so straightforward within the, the Siena framework. And then talk about heterogeneity and if there's time, um, some open questions related to, to selection. Okay, but first, what is a Siena model? Right? You've heard mentions of it throughout the, um, throughout the workshop. Um, the Siena model is, is useful when we have network panel data. That's the one um, common theme. You can think about a Siena model really as a framework. Um, it's a framework for modeling complete network data. And I say complete because um, what we're really talking about is, 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 is data on a bounded population, um, something like a school or an organization where we have um, um, you know, a, a note set and ties within that note set, though there is some room for, for missing data there. And what we're interested in doing is modeling change across these discrete network observations. Um, change is modeled from an actor's perspective, hence the actor orientation. So it's, it's each actor in the network making decisions about how, how to change their network. Um, and we, we break up these discrete time points. Um, the, the model assumes there are a number of micro steps um, between this. So there's actually a continuous time process between these discrete observations when the network um, is allowed to change and kind of one actor changing a tie at a time. Um, now I mentioned CN as a framework um, because really all you need is, um, you know, the, the minimum data requirements are panel network data, okay? But you can add on all kinds of stuff. You can add on multiple networks, so we could be modeling a friendship network, but we could also have a second network um, that is status relations or some other kind of advice relations or, or something like that. So we can have multiplex networks and, 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 and model those multiple layers. We can bring in behavior, which is um, why we're talking about this today because um, behaviors is, different kinds of behaviors or attitudes, those kinds of 
changing actor variables um, are oftentimes what we're interested in and why we're, we're turning to networks as, a, as an explanation for why those behaviors might be changing. We can also bring in two-mode networks. Um, we heard a little bit about that earlier today. Um, two-mode networks or bipartite networks. We can bring those in and model their change as well. Um, really, an advantage of the Sienna model is that we can bring each of these kinds of data objects in and model them endogenously. So we model their change. Um, <clears throat> we also model, can model how they affect one another. Right? So a changing friendship network can change um, individuals' behavior. So my behavior might be, um, <clears throat> isn't just, isn't just um, kind of affected by my friend um, at time one when it, was, when it was observed, but as my friendships are changing and as their friends are changing, that can change um, my own behavior. Okay, so that allows us to model um, peer influence effects, um, allows us to model selection effects, and as the network is changing, it can change, it can affect behavior, and as behavior is changing, it can affect others' behavior through the, through the network. Now, a common reason we're using a Sienna model is we want to get at this question of selection versus influence. Okay, so we have a sortativity on an outcome like this, right? A is choosing B. Um, say as a, as a friend, um, and that's um, and A and B have the same behavior denoted by the color of the node. We see this, and we want to know what what led to this. And we are oftentimes interested: is it um, is it peer influence, right? Where A and B were friends already, and then B influenced A to to change their behavior. Okay, <clears throat> that requires that we model behavior change. Right, we're looking at the behavior change part of it. But it could just as easily be this homophilus selection. We, what we typically call selection, but it's really a homophilus selection, not, not another type of selection that's leading to this. So A and B might not have been friends, but they're engaged in the same behavior, and that leads them to, to become friends. And so to get at that, to control for that, what the Siena model does is, it, is it's going to model network change as well. Okay. So here is a kind of a typical Sienna analysis that, that models both um, change in a friendship network and change in a behavior. In this case, we're looking at um, BMI as the, as the behavior. Um, we've got a host of effects predicting BMI, um, change in BNI, including down here um, what's called a total similarity effect, or really my um, ones, um, the, the effect of friends and their BMI on an individual's BMI. So we're modeling, we have a function that models BMI. You can think of this kind of a, very naively as, um, I think BMI here was overweight, not overweight, two levels. You can think of that as a logistic regression, uh, more or less, where um, actors are choosing um, one level over the other. Simultaneously, we're modeling a friendship function, or a network function, more generally. Um, and here we have a bunch of effects. You've seen some of these already um, that are predicting um, within, within each dyad in the network, um, predicting whether or not um, ego sends a tie to alter. So one person sends a tie to another. Um, again, naively, you can think of that kind of like an ergum. It's a lot like an ergum in that we have um, individual level statistics or, or attributes that can matter, um, dyadic attributes like Homophily can drive, can drive relationships. Um, network attributes, reciprocity, transitivity. The important thing for questions about peer influence, though, is that we can also control for, um, for instance, similarity on the attribute. Um, so in this case, the example of BMI, we can control for two individuals already being similar on BMI and then becoming friends. Okay, so that's how we're, we're getting at parsing out this selection versus, versus influence part. Um, we can have alter and ego effects that also get at our um, individuals um, who are overweight, more or less likely to send ties, more or less likely to be named as a friend. Okay. Now this is a typical approach and we often um, don't talk a whole lot about how network influence is measured, um, but that can, um, can, can, there's a lot of different ways of measuring that and it can mean very, very different things. Okay, so uh, I've got an example here of um, 
the effect that I just showed you is something called a similarity effect. And there's an equation for it here. You can look in the Siena model to see equations for how, how, how all these things are, are defined. Similarity is really, um, it, it, it's, it's measured as absolute difference between two individuals um, and kind of reverse coded so that it's similarity, not difference. Um, but more or less, it's, it's, it's this, this kind of effect is getting at, if I'm considering changing my behavior, I look at my friends and do, do, am I more likely to make a change that leads me to be further from them on average or closer to them on average? Okay, pretty, pretty intuitive idea. When we see a, a significant um, peer influence effect like this, it means individuals are moving closer to the mean of their friends. Okay, so here, uh, the friend's mean is in blue, person A is moving closer, person B is moving closer. That's what this, um, this kind of effect is, is, is designed to pick up. Okay? We also have these effects called alter effects. Okay? Um, and I don't know if you can see the equation down here. Um, alter effects are really a function of what's my, what's my alter's behavior? Is it above the population mean? Is it below the population? So my friends, are they higher than average or, or, or lower than average? Um, this kind of effect means something very different when influence is occurring. Um, what this does is, <clears throat> if there's peer influence, it means I'm being pulled away from the mean, the overall mean, in the direction of my friends. Okay, so you can see person A here. Um, the dot represents person A's um, behavior at the time, um, smoking level at the time. If peer influence is present because friends are above the mean, the population, it means they're being pulled above the mean. <clears throat> this also happens for, so, 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 so in this case, this person is being pulled away from their friends. Right? They're becoming more dissimilar to their friends. Um, an example of this, um, would be in, in, in the area of child development, this idea of deviancy training, where friends, boys, most often, try to outcompete one another to see how delinquent they can be. So you see this kind of escalation of behavior. So in this case, we've got escalation of smoking, kind of, kind of friends pushing one another further and further away from, away from the mean. Um, person B, notice they're kind of doing the same thing as before. They're moving, um, <clears throat> They're moving above the mean. In this case, it's towards their friend mean, but that just happens to be because they're at a lower starting point. So it's really <clears throat> scenarios like person A where you're going to see these differences um, in, these, in these influence effects. Okay, so really thinking about what is the process responsible for um, the network effect, what do I think is happening is what's um, kind of important is a, how do you choose between these? Right, is, is we try to think what's, what's happening within um, friendships that's going to be driving this. Um, so this leads to a more, a more general point. Um, we talk about a lot of different processes um, kind of as being responsible for network effects, socialization, social learning, reinforcement, uh, maybe it's exposure and diffusion kinds of, kinds of things. There's a lot happening. Rarely are we measuring that process. Right? Rarely are we going into a, a, a friendship and, and watching what happens, recording what happens, and, 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 and seeing is it, um, is it one of these processes. Instead, what we're typically doing is we're operationalizing some, you know, a, a theory based upon a pattern of connections and watching individuals and how their behavior changes over time. Okay, so we're looking at their, their structural imprint. Many of these processes will show Kind of the, the effect I saw before, where, or I showed before, where two people become more similar over time. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so that kind of network assimilation um, could be the response to a lot of different, or produced through a lot of different processes. Um, but some of these processes have other signatures as well that we can, we can try, to, try to pick up. So I want to run through some other ways of thinking about network influence. Um, and I break these up into kind of three different types. So we can think of network effects as being the result of strictly the structure of connections or the, the layout of ties. This gets at the notion of position that, that Jim was talking about yesterday. So um, alters behavior. 
not important at all. Strictly the structure of one's network. We can also think about effects that are purely based on content or something about the people I'm connected to and their behavior, who, who they are. Or we can think about those things interacting. Okay, and so I've just got some, a few illustrative examples of these. Um, there, there, there are many more patterns. Um, so we can think about a, a host of degree-related effects. Right? So are um, people with more or fewer ties um, differentially kind of expected to engage in different kinds of behaviors? So are isolates more likely to smoke? Right? So within Siena, if you haven't worked with Siena, um, it's um, kind of like our StatNet package in a way. You've got these short names that refer to different kinds of um, effects and refer to different equations here um, that kind of specify what is this, what is this network structure. Um, so I've put those in here for you to, you to go back and look at later. Um, but I'm going to focus more just on kind of the, the general pattern. And we can imagine, you know, simply the number of connections, whether it's in degree, out degree, or reciprocated degree, those might have effects on the outcome we're interested in. It's things like drinking, um, smoking, loneliness. Um, so notice this isn't a contagion effect. We're not talking about contagion of drinking or smoking or loneliness. We're talking about how, how the structure of ties matters. Okay, we can um, also think about triadic configurations. Okay, so does being in, so take, take for instance, you know, if, if ego is this, this node right here and we're, we're, we're trying to um, model um, change in an outcome like um, depression or, or, or loneliness or um, does being in an embedded, kind of this closed, closed triad with either five or six of the, the possible ties there, does being in that kind of closed triad um, <clears throat> produce more or less of, of the outcome? So we can measure, we can measure that as well. Content forms of influence, I think, are closer to what we th often think about with, in terms of behavior change and behavior spreading across a network. Um, I mentioned the average similarity effect earlier. Um, but we can also think about, um, beyond the direct connections, um, think about indirect connections. So alters, alters behavior might affect an individual's behavior. So um, Krager and Haney had a paper a few years back looking at do um, do, do teens adopt the drinking behavior of their friends' friends and found that, it, yes, they do. And their argument is, well, in order to impress one's friends, one might adopt the behavior of their other friends. Um, so um, we, can, we can test for those kinds of effects. We can also test for um, other alter attributes. Okay, so in a in, in, in recent paper, um, with one of my grad students, we looked at does, does contact with a particular ethno-racial group, um, and particularly other than one's own, um, does that affect one's level of prejudice? Okay, so here we're, we're, we're not looking at prejudice itself spreading or, 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 you know, not spreading. We're looking at contact with certain types of alters. So a different attribute and having alters with that attribute affecting one's, one's um, behavior. Um, all right, I, I want to mention a few more effects that are um, kind of in the, in the vein of interactions between content and structure, but I, I want to introduce a caveat here, and that um, oftentimes with Siena models, um, we have low power. If we're looking at just one network, um, we often have low power to actually test these. So um, um, a little bit of a warning here that um, about that. If you have larger networks or more slices, time slices, more periods of change, you're more likely to be able to detect moderating effects. Um, but generally, um, kind of testing for moderation is, is can be um, yeah can be tricky. And testing for different kinds of peer influence, so putting multiple peer influence effects in the same model to try to get at what's the form of, of influence. Um, is also tricky and very difficult, and oftentimes effects are too, too confounded for that. Um, but, so with that caveat, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and talk about some that I think are, are worth thinking about. Um, so this dense triads effect, right? We can, we can look at the 
um, interaction between being in a closed triad and um, influence on a particular behavior. Okay, so in this case, um, you know, maybe, again, looking at this, this ego, again, maybe if two alters, two friends are smoking, but they're also friends with each other, that exerts a stronger kind of normative um, effect than, you know, individually or summed across those dyads. So we can, we can test, for, um, test for that interaction. Um, we can also test for, um, in this case, um, alters in degree. So look at our, our, our alters who are more popular, more influential, are we more likely to adopt the behavior of our um, popular friends versus our less popular friends? <clears throat> we can also look at kind of interactions between um, kind of individual attributes, friends attributes, and, and the influence process. So we can ask, are certain kinds of um, actors, actors with certain kinds of attributes, for instance, younger adolescents, maybe they're more susceptible to peer influence than, than their older peers? Um, or are certain kind of actors more influential? Um, and so, for instance, we've talked about identifying opinion leaders um, or other kinds of, you know, kind of target nodes for, for diffusing or spreading an intervention. We can test, um, you know, follow up with that kind of intervention with a test of, you know, are those nodes more influential um, than, than others in the network? Um, I also want to mention dyadic properties. Um, so um, we're often interested in whether or not certain kinds of dyads are more influential. The, 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 I think the, the talk we just had um, was talking about our, our within group um, ties more influential than cross-group ties. So that's something we can, we can test. Um, so there's a couple ways to do that I want to I wanna point out. Um, the first way is to test, um, we, we, we include an effect like average similarity that gets at, are, are all my alters, across all my alters, do they influence me? And then have an offset effect to test whether certain kinds of peers differ in their level of influence. So here the question is, <clears throat> is peer influence from one group stronger or different um, in magnitude than peer influence from another group? Okay, so we can, we can test that. A, a similar kind of question would be, do, do two groups both exert influence? Um, you know, <clears throat> so we might, again, we might look at two types of dyads, um, same race dyads here cross-race dyads here, for example. And we might want to test, is there peer influence in each type of dyad? You know, which is a, again, a different question than if the strength of peer influence differs. We can test this. It requires a slightly different, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, one thing that I find a lot of trouble with um, is that, so I work with um, an organization that wants me to find threshold, uh, numerical thresholds to put into a model Yeah, yeah, some, some of those are easier than others. Um, the, the threshold in terms of number of alters is very easy. It's, uh, there's an effect for it. I mean, running Sienna models, you've got to get very used to, you know, kind of going through pages of pages of manuals trying to find the effect that matches it, but there is a threshold one that would, that would get at that. Um, getting at um, relational qualities can be tricky because oftentimes we only have relational qualities. We only measure those on relationships that exist, not ones that don't exist. And, and so when, when relationships are changing endogenously, we, we can't predict relational qualities for ties that don't exist. We don't have that data. So that's, that one's a little trickier, um, but, but there may be some creative ways to work, work around it. Yeah. 
Right. I should mention if there are questions, I'm, I'm just going to blow through stuff. So if there are questions along the way, um, better to just ask me as we go along. All right. Um, OK, so last, the last um, one I, I want to mention, too, is, is we, don't, we don't get into this a whole lot, but we can actually specify a Sienna model as a, as a diffusion model, um, kind of in the spirit of a proportional hazard model where we're watching something diffuse across a network. Um, and <clears throat> we do that um, by focusing, um, okay, so data-wise, we've got some outcome that's 0, 1, present or absent. It only increases across time. Um, the Sienna model, if that's your data, um, will, if the algorithm recognizes that constraint on the data and will we'll ensure that that constraint is, 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 is upheld within, um, when fitting. But you can actually model um, kind of diffusion type influence effects in that, in that case. So we can, again, you can think of um, kind of total and average effects of um, exposure or number of, of number of adopters. That, that one is connected to. Um, you can also look at, again, certain attributes, uh, making one more susceptible, more influential, um, similar kinds of ideas as, as with the regular model. Um, right? The regular model being, you know, peers can influence me to increase my behavior, but also decrease my behavior. Okay, so we've got this, um, this flexibility as well. All right. Um, now I want to talk about categorical outcomes. Um, thus far, we've talked about um, kind of implicitly assumed outcomes were um, kind of dummy variables or continuous. The way Sienna models work is um, for, for most models, you need an ordinal specification 